A Body of Doctrinal Divinity, Book 3, by Dr. John Gill, of the External Acts of God, narrated by David Clark, Chapter 3, of the Creation of Man. Man was made last of all the creatures, being the chief and masterpiece of the whole creation on earth, whom God had principally and first in view in making the world, and all things in it, according to that known rule, that what is first in intention is last in execution. God, proceeding in his works as artificers in their form, a less perfect to a more perfect work, till they come to what they have chiefly in view, a finished piece of work, in which they employ all their skill, and which, coming after the rest, appears to great advantage. Man is a compendium of the creation, and therefore is sometimes called a microcosm, a little world, a world in miniature, sometimes of a vegetable, animal and rational world meet in him. Spiritual and corporal substance, or spirit and matter, are joined together in him. Yea, heaven and earth centre in him. He is the bond that connects them both together. All creatures were made for his sake, to possess, enjoy and have the dominion over, and therefore he was made last of all. And herein appear the wisdom and goodness of God to him, that all accommodations were already provided for him when made. The earth for his habitation, all creatures for his use, the fruits of the earth for his profit and pleasure, light, heat and air for his delight, comfort and refreshment, with everything that could be wished for and desired to him to make his life happy. Man was made on the sixth day, the last day of the creation, and not before, nor were there any of the same species made before Adam, who is therefore called the first man Adam. There have been some who have gone by the name of pre-Adamites because they held there was men before Adam. So the Zabians held and speak of one that was his master. And in the last century, one, Perirus, wrote a book in Latin in favour of the same notion, which has been refuted by learned men over and over. It is certain that sin entered into the world and death by sin, by one man, even the first man Adam, from whom death was commenced, and from whom it has reigned over since. Romans five, twelve and 14. Now, if there were men before Adam, they must have been all alive at his formation. There had been no death among them. And if they had been of any long standing before him, as the notion supposes, the world, in all probability, was as much peopled as it may be now. And if so, why should God say, let us make man, when there must have been a great number of men in being already? And what occasion was there for such an extraordinary production of men? Why was Adam formed out of the dust of the earth, and Eve out of one of his ribs? And these two coupled together, that the race of men might spring from them, if there were men before. But it is certain that Adam was the first man, and he is called not only with respect to Christ the second Adam, but because he was the first of the human race, and the common parent of mankind, and Eve, the mother of all living, that is, of all men living. The Apostle Paul says that God has made of one blood, that is, of the blood of one man, all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Acts 17 verse 26. And this he said in the presence of the wise philosophers at Athens, who, though they objected to the new strange deities they supposed he introduced, yet said not one word against the account he gave of the original of mankind. But what puts this out of all question with those that believe the divine revelation is that it is expressly said that before Adam was formed there was not a man to till the ground. Genesis 2 verse 5 Man was made after and upon a consultation held concerning his creation. Let us make man, Genesis 1.26, which is an address not to second causes, not to the elements, nor to the earth, for God could, if he would, have commanded the earth to have brought forth man forth at once, as he commanded it to bring forth grass, herbs, trees, and living creatures of all sorts, and have not consulted with it. Nor is it an address to angels, who were never of God's privy counsel, nor was man made after their image, 
he was corporal, they incorporal. But the address was made by Jehovah the Father too, and the consultation was held by him with the other two divine persons in the deity, the Son and Spirit, a like phrase used in Genesis 3.22, 11.7, Isaiah 6.8, and such a consultation being held about the making of man, as was not at the making of any of the rest of the creatures, shows what an excellent and finished piece of work God meant to make. Concerning the creation of man, the following things may be observed. 1. The author of his creation, God. God so created man, Genesis 1, 27. Not man himself, a creature cannot create, and much less itself, nor angels, for then they would be entitled to worship from man, which they have refused, because their fellow servants, and it might be added, their fellow creatures. But God, who is the creator of the ends of the earth, was the creator of the first man, and of all since, for we are all his offspring, and therefore are exhorted to remember our creator, Ecclesiastes 12.1, or creators, for so it is in the original text. For, as they were more concerned in the consultation about man's creation, so in the creation of him, and the same that were in the one were in the other, even Father, Son and Spirit. Hence, we read of God, our makers, in various passages of the scripture, Job 35.10, Psalm 1492, Isaiah 54.5, that God the Father, who made the heavens and the earth and sea, and all that in them are, made man among the rest, and particularly made him, will not be questioned, nor need there be any doubt about the Son of God, since without him, the eternal word, was not anything made that was made. Then, not man, and if all things were made and created by him, whether visible and invisible, then man was made by him, who must be reckoned among those all things. 1 John 1-3, to Colossians 1, 16. The character and relation of an husband to the church more particularly belongs to Christ, and her husband is expressly said to be her maker, Isaiah 54, 5. Compare with Psalm 95, 6 to 8 and Hebrew 3, 6 to 7. Nor is the Holy Spirit to be excluded from the formation of man, who had a concern in the whole creation. Genesis 1, 3, Job 26, 13, Psalm 33, verse 6. And to whom Elihu particularly ascribes his formation. Job 33, verse 4. And why not the first man made by him also? Yea, the act of breathing into man the breath of life when he became a living soul seems most agreeable to him the spirit and breath of god and who has a great concern in the recreation or renovation of man even his regeneration therefore the three divine persons should be remembered as creators and be feared worshipped and adored as such and thanks be given them for creation preservation and for all the mercies of life bountifully provided by them it is pretty remarkable that the word created should be used three times in one verse, where the creation of man is only spoken of, as it should seem to point out the three divine persons concerning therein. Genesis 1, 27. 2. The constituent or essential parts of man created by God, which are two, body and soul, these appear to be his first formation. The one was made out of the dust, the other was breathed into him, and so, at his dissolution, the one returns to the dust, from whence it was, and the other to God, that gave it, and indeed, death is no other than the desolation or disunion of these parts. The body without the spirit is dead. The one dies, the other does not. First, the body, which is a most wonderful structure, and must appear so when it is considered with what precision and exactness every part is formed for its proper use, even every muscle, vein and artery, yea, the least fibre, and that every limb is set in its proper place to answer its designed end, and all in just symmetry and proportion and in a subserviency to the use of each other and for the good of the whole, to enter into detail of particulars more properly belongs to it antonomy and that art is now brought into such a degree of perfection that by it most amazing discoveries are made in the structure of the human body 
as the circulation of the blood, etc., so that it may well be said of the other bodies, as David said of his, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, verse 14. The erect posture of man is not to be omitted, which so remarkably distinguishes him from the four-footed animals who look downwards to the earth, and by which man is fitted and directed to look upwards to the heavens, to contemplate them and the glory of God displayed in them, and even to look up to God above them, to worship and adore him, to praise him for mercies received, to pray to him for what are wanted, as well as instructs man in that set of affections, not on things on earth, but on things in heaven. And indeed, it is natural for every man, whether in any great distress, or when favoured with an unexpected blessing, and when he receives tidings that surprise him, whether of good or bad things, to turn his face upwards. In the Greek language, man has his name from turning and looking upwards. The body of man is very fair and beautiful, for if children of men, or of Adam, are fair, as is suggested in Psalm 45 too, then most certainly Adam himself was created fair and beautiful, and some think he had the name Adam given him from his beauty, the root of the word in the Ethiopic language signifies to be fair and beautiful. And though external beauty is a vain thing to gaze at, and for men to pride themselves with, in this their fallen state, when God can easily, by a disease, cause their beauty to consume away as a moth. Yet it is a property and quality in the composition of man, at first not to be overlooked, since it greatly exceeds what may be observed of this kind in the rest of the creatures. The body of man was also originally made immortal, not that it was of itself and in its own nature, being made of the elements of the earth and so reducible to the same again, and was supported even at the state of innocence, with corruptible food. But God, who only has immortality, conferred it on the body of man, so that if he never sinned, his body would not have been mortal, or have died, nor is it any objection to it that it was supported with food, for God could have supported it without food, as long as he pleased or forever he could have supported it with food not to take notice of the tree of life which some think was designed as a means of continuing man's life perpetually if he had not sinned but without that as god could and did support the body of adam with food even when it became mortal through sin for the space of nine hundred years and more he could have supported it for the space of nine thousand and so onwards had it been his pleasure, and therefore there can be no difficulty in conceiving that he could have supported it in an unfallen state, when it had the gift of immortality, in the same way forever. Besides, God could, by a new act of special grace and goodness, have translated Adam to heaven, or to the higher state of life, to greater nearness and communion with him, and supported his body without food forever, as the bodies of Enoch and Elijah translated that they should not see death, and have been thousands of years supported without food, and as the body of Christ is, and the bodies of the saints that rose at his resurrection are, and all the bodies of men after the resurrection will be, and it is most clear from the word of God that death did not arise from a necessity of nature, but from sin. Sin entered the world, and death by sin and through the offence of one, many be dead. The wages of sin is death. Yea, it is expressly said, the body is dead because of sin. Romans 5.12, 15, 6, 23, 8, 10. And indeed, to what purpose was the threatening given out? In the day thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Genesis 2.17 If man of necessity must have died, whether he had sinned or not, as say the Pelagians of the Sakinians, and which, if they could, they would maintain in order to avoid the force of the argument in favour of original sin, they deny from death being the fruit and effects and punishment of sin of Adam. But now, though this body was so wonderfully and beautifully formed and gifted with immortality, yet it was made out of the dust of the earth. Genesis 2.7 
that it macerated with water, and so properly clay. Hence man is said to be made out of clay, and the bodies of men are like bodies of clay, and have their foundation in the dust. Job 4, 8, 13, 12, 33, 6, Isaiah 64, 8. Hence, some think that Adam has the name from Adama, earth, out of which he was formed, red earth, as Josephus calls it, as in the Latin he is called homo, from humus, the ground. And this is the humbling consideration to proud man, and especially in the sight of God when compared with him, and still more, as this clay of his is now, through sin, become frail, brittle and mortal, and his dust, sinful dust and ashes, Genesis 18.27, and it may serve to take down the haughtiness and pride of some men, who vaunt over their fellow creatures, and boast of their body and of their families, when all are made out of the same mass and lump of clay, of one blood all nations of men are for. Secondly, the soul is the other part of man created by God, which is a substance or subsistence. It is not an accident or quality inherent in a subject, but is capable of subsisting of itself. It is not a good temperament of the body, as some have fancied, nor is it mere thought. It is indeed a thinking substance, in which thought is, and is exercised by it, but is distinct from it. It cannot be a mere quality or accident, because that is not properly created, at least by itself, but is concreated or created with the subjects in which it is. Whereas the spirit of man is formed or created by God within him, Zechariah 12.1, it is itself the subject of qualities, of all arts and science, and in its depraved state, the subject of vices, and of virtues, and of graces. It is an inhabitant of the body, dwells in it, as in a tabernacle, and removes from it at death, and exits in a spirit state after it. All which show it is a substance or subsistence of itself. It is not a corporal, but a spiritual substance, not a body, as Tertullian and others have thought, but a spirit, as it is often called in Scripture, Ecclesiastes 12.3, Matthew 26.41, Acts 7.59. And the souls of men are called the spirits of all flesh, to distinguish them from angelic spirits, which are not surrounded with flesh. As the spirits of men are, Numbers 16.22, the soul is immediately breathed from God, as Adam's soul was, and in it is chiefly consists the image of God in man, and therefore must be a spirit, as he is. Though in a finite proportion, a created spirit, it is also immaterial. It does not consist of flesh and blood and bones, as the body does, and so is immortal, and dies not when that does. When that goes to the dust, the soul returns to God. The body may be killed by men, but not the soul. When they have killed the one, they can proceed no further. The soul survives the body and lives after. It consists of various powers and faculties and understanding, will, etc., and performs various operations of life, either immediately by itself or immediately by the organs of the body, in the vegetable, animal and rational way, and therefore is called the spirit or breath of lives. Genesis 2, 7, and yet is but one. For, though sometimes mention is made of the soul and spirit, as if they were distinct, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Hebrews 4, 12, yet this only respects the superior and inferior powers of the faculties of one of the same soul. For otherwise, the scriptures always represent man as having but one soul, and this is created by God. It is not uncreated as he is, nor is it created by angels, as some have fancied, nor of himself, nor is it generated by and derived from the immediate parent. The soul of Adam was most certainly created of God, and immediately, and breathed into him, and the same may be believed of the soul of Eve, for it cannot be thought that that was contained in it, and adduced out of the rib from which her body was made, when that was made. God breathed into her the breath of life, as he did into Adam, and there is no reason why the souls of all men should not be made or created in like manner. Some have been and are of the opinion that the souls of men are extraduced as Tertullian, or generated by and derived from their parents, from their bodies, 
But against this it may be observed that Christ was made in all things like unto us, having a true body and reasonable soul, which soul of his could not be generated by and derived from his parents, not from a father, because he had none, as man, nor from his mother, for then she, being a sinful woman, it must have been infected and defiled from the contagion of sin, the corruption of nature, whereas he was holy and harmless, without spot and blemish. Moreover, if souls are by natural generation from their immediate parents, they must be derived either from their bodies or from their bodies and souls, or from their souls only, not from their bodies, for then they would be corporal, whereas they are not, not from both bodies and souls, for then they would be partly corporal and partly incorporal, which they are not, not from their souls only, for as an angel is not generated by an angel, so not the soul by a soul. Therefore, if the bodies of men are derived from the souls of parents, it is either from a part of them or from the whole, not from a part, for then the soul will be partable, indivisible, as matter is, and so not immaterial, and as not part. So neither can their whole souls be thought to be communicated by them, for then they would have none, and perished. To such absurdities is this notion reducible. Besides, what is immaterial, as the soul is, can never be adduced out of matter. If the soul is generated out of the matter of a parent, then it is and must be material. And if material, then corporal, and if corporal, then mortal. And it is a maxim that what is generated may be corrupted. And if the soul may be corrupted, then it is not immortal. The doctrine of the soul's immortality becomes indefensible by this notion. For if this be abetted, the other must be relinquished. But what puts this matter out of all doubt is the distinction the Apostle makes between the fathers of our flesh and the father of spirits. Hebrews 12.9 Man consists of two parts, of flesh and spirit, body and soul. The form the Apostle ascribes to immediate parents and instruments thereof, and the latter of God as the father, author and creator of it. Nor is it an objection of any moment to the soul being the immediate creation of God, that then a man does not generate a man, to which it may be replied that he may be said to generate a man, though strictly speaking he only generates a part of him, as when one man kills another he is truly said to kill a man, though he only kills the body. So a man may be said to generate a man, though he only generates the body, from whence in this cause man is denominated, Moreover, as in death, the whole man may be said to die, because death is a dissolution of the whole, though each part remains. So the whole man may be said to be generated, because in generation there is a union and conjunction of the parts of man, though one part is not generated. Yet because of the notion of the parts, the whole is said to be. Nor is it an objection of greater weight that man does not do what other creatures do, generate the whole of their species, as a horse, a horse, not only the flesh, but the spirits of it, since it is not at all derogatory to man, but it is his superior excellency, that his soul is not generated as the spirits of a beast, but comes immediately from the hand of God. Such who are otherwise right in their notions of things, give in to this, in order to get clear of a difficulty attending the doctrine of original sin, and the manner of its propagation, which they think is more easily accounted for by supposing the soul derived from parents by natural generation, and so corrupted. But though this is a difficulty not easily to be resolved, how the soul, coming immediately from God, is corrupted with original sin, it is better to let this difficulty lie unresolved than to give up so certain a truth and of such importance as the doctrine of the immortality of the soul is, which, as has been seen, must be given up if this notion is received. But there are ways and methods for clearing this difficulty, without being at the expense of the loss of such an important truth, as will be shown when we come to treat of the doctrine of original sin. In the meanwhile, 
Let us take it for granted that souls are of God's immediate creation. The making of them he claims of himself. The souls that are made, Isaiah 57, 16, Jeremiah 38, 16. The souls of men are not made in eternity, but in time. The pre-existence of all human souls before the world was is a notion held by Plato among the heathens, and especially by Oregon among Christians, but is exploded by all wise, thoughtful and judicious men. For whatever was before the world was is eternal. If souls were created before the world, then they are eternal, whereas there was nothing before the world but God, to whom eternity only belongs, Psalm 90 verse 2. Nor were souls created together, as angels were, but they are created one by one. When the bodies are prepared to receive them, they are not created without the body, and then put into it, but they are formed in it, who formeth the spirit of man within him, Zechariah 12, 1. Not brought from without us, Aristotle expresses it, but when the embryo is fit to receive it, it is created by God and united to it. But how is it united, and what is the bond of this union? We must be content to be ignorant of as well as of the particular place of its abode, whether diffused through the whole body, as some think, or has an apartment in the brain, or has a seat in the heart, which is most likely and most agreeable to Scripture, and to that known maxim, that the heart is the first that lives and the last that dies. 3. The difference of sex, in which man was created, male and female, Genesis 1.27, that is, man and woman. Not that they were created together, though on the same day, and perhaps not long one after the other, the male was created first, out of him the female, as the Apostle says, Adam was first formed, then Eve, 1 Timothy 2.13, which he observes to show that the woman should not usurp authority over the man, since he was before her, and by which it appears that man was not created for the woman but the woman for the man. As he elsewhere asserts, 1 Colossians 11.9, and therefore ought to be in subjection to him. Nor were they made out of the same matter, at least not as in the same form. Their souls induced were equally made out of nothing, out of no pre-existent matter, but their bodies differently. The body of Adam was formed out of the dust of the earth, the body of Eve out of the rib of Adam though both originally dust and clay to which they both returned. The woman, very significantly made out of man, not out of the upper part of man, lest she should be thought to have superiority over him, nor out of his lower part of man, lest she should be despised and trampled upon, but from a rib of him, to signify that she should be by his side, a companion of him, and from a part near his heart and under his arm to show that she should be the object of his love and affection, and be always under his care and protection, and thus, being flesh out of his flesh, as he himself owned, it became him to nourish and cherish her as his own flesh. Man is a superior creature, and therefore God, in his wisdom, thought it not proper that he should be alone, but provided and help me for him, to be a partner and a companion of him, in civil and religious life, and in this difference the sexes were created for the sake of procreation of children and of the propagation of their species in their successive offspring to the end of the world. And there were but one male and one female as at first created and which were joined together in marriage by the Lord himself to teach that by one man and one woman only are to be joined together at one time in lawful wedlock. And these two male and female first created were made after the same image for the word man includes both man and woman and adam was a name common to them both in their creation and when said to be made after the image of god genesis 1 26 27 5 1 2 which image will be hereafter be seen lies much in righteousness and holiness now god made man that is both man and woman upright but they Adam and Eve sought out many inventions, sinful ones, and so lost their righteousness, 
nor is it an objection to the woman being made after the image of God, of part of which lies in the dominion over the creatures, as will hereafter be observed that she is in subjection to the man. For though her husband ruled over her, yet she had equal dominion with him over the creatures, which leads on to consider. 4. The image of God in which man was created. God said, Let us make man in our image, and after our likeness. So God created him in his own image. Genesis 1, 26 and 7. Whether image and likeness are to be distinguished, as by Maimonides, and one respecting the substantial form of man, his soul, and the other certain accidents and qualities belong to him, or whether they signify the same, is not very material. The matter seems probable, since, Genesis one twenty seven, where image is mentioned, likeness is omitted, and on the contrary, in Genesis 5.1, the word likeness is used, and image omitted. Now, though this is only said of man, that he is made after the image and likeness of God, yet he is not the only creature so made. Angels are like to God, and bear a resemblance to him, being spirits, immaterial, immortal, and invisible, and are also righteous and holy in their nature, and are sometimes called Elohim. Yet the image of God in man differs in some things from theirs, as that part of it especially, which lies in the body, and in his connection with the dominion over the creatures, and yet he is not, in such sense, the image of God, as Jesus Christ the Son of God is, who is the image of the invisible God, yet the expressed image of his Father's person, having the same divine nature and perfections as his. But man, though there was in him some likeness and resemblance of some of the perfections of God, which are called his imitable ones, and by some communicable, as holiness, righteousness, and wisdom, etc., yet these perfections are not really in him, only some faint shadows of them, at least not in the manner and proportion that they are in God, in whom they are infinite, in man finite. And though the renewed and spiritual image of God is in regenerated persons, which is an higher and more excellent kind than the natural image of God in Adam was called, a partaker of the divine nature. 2 Peter 1 4, yet not to be understood as if they partook of the nature and essence of God and the perfections of it, only that it is wrought in them and impressed on them, that bears some resemblance to the divine nature. The seat of the image of God in man is the whole man, both body and soul. Wherefore God is said to create man in his image, not the soul only, nor the body only, but the whole man, Genesis one twenty seven five one, Even as the whole man, soul and body, are the seat of the new and the spiritual image of God in regeneration and sanctification, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, which the apostle immediately explains in their whole spirit and soul and body, being preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when, and at the resurrection of the dead, the saints will most fully appear to bear the image of the heavenly one. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, 1 Corinthians 15.24, 15.49. First, the man was made in the image of God, in his body, in some respects. Hence, this is given as a reason why the blood of a man's body is not to be shed, because in the image of God made he man, Genesis 9.6, Though this image must not be thought to consist in the lineaments of the figure of man's body, this would be to conceive of him as altogether such a one as ourselves. And as the anthropomorphites do, who because they find bodily members ascribed to God in Scripture as eyes, hands, and fancy that he is a body like ours, and that our bodies are like his. But as Job says, hath thou eyes of flesh. Job 10 verse 4. No, he has not. And the same may be observed of other members ascribed unto him. For we are not to entertain such gross notions of God as if he were corporal, or that man was like unto him in the structure of his body. Not, but there is something divine and majestic in the countenance of man in comparison to brute creatures. And what is superior and excellent to them is the erectness and posture 
as has been before observed, which fits and directs him to look up to God, whereby he is a nearness to him and communion with him, through which he becomes more like unto him. And it may be observed that the perfections of God, many of them, are represented by the members of the human body, as his omniscience, an all-seeing providence by eye, which go to and fro throughout the whole earth, his omnipresence and close attention to the petitions of his people, the readiness to help and assist them by ears upon their cries, and his might and power to deliver, protect and defend them by an arm and hand, and his pleasure and displeasure by his face being towards good men and against bad men, with others that might be added. Some qualities of the body of the first man he had from God, which made him in some sense like unto him, such as immortality. For not only the soul of man breathing to him was immortal, but his body also, as has been before observed. And in this there was in him some likeness to God, who only had immortality in the highest sense, and it likewise righteousness and holiness, another branch of his divine image, as will be hereafter taken notice of, of which the body, as well as the soul, is the seat. For, as that is defiled since the fall, with the corruption of nature, so before it was pure and holy, and when sanctified by the Spirit of God, it becomes a temple in which he dwells, and particularly at the resurrection, when it is raised a powerful, incorporeal, spiritual and glorious body. Saints will then be awake in the likeness of God, and appear to bear the image of the heavenly one, as in soul, so in body, whereas another branch of this image lies in dominion over the creatures, that is chiefly exercised by the organs of the body. To say no more, I see no difficulty in admitting it, that whereas all members of Christ's human body are written and delineated in the book of God's eternal purpose and decrees before they were fashioned, or were in actual being, and God prepared a body for him in covenant, agreeable thereunto, or it was concluded in it, he should assume such a body in the fullness of time. Psalm 39, Psalm 139, 16, Hebrews 10, 5. I say, I see no difficulty in admitting that the body of Adam was formed according to the idea of the body of Christ in the divine mind, and which may be the reason, at least in part, of that expression, Behold, the man is, or rather was, as one of us. And so, as Eve was flesh of Adam's flesh, and bone of his bone, the members of Christ are also flesh of his flesh, and bone of his bone. Genesis 3.22 2.23, Ephesians 5.10. But, secondly, the principal seat of the image of God in man is the soul, which was immediately breathed of God into man, and so bears the greatest resemblance of him, and thus the spiritual image of God stamped in regeneration is chiefly seated in the soul. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ephesians 4.23, and this appears 1. In the nature of the soul, which is spiritual, immaterial, immortal, invisible as God is, God is a spirit, most simple and uncompounded, more so than any created spirit can be supposed to be. Yet the soul, which is often called a spirit, bears some likeness to him. He is expert of all matter, and only hath immortality. And so the soul is not a material being, but a spirit. It is not flesh and bone as the body has, and is not capable of being brought to the dust of death, or be killed. And as no man has seen God at any time, he is the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, so the soul is not to be seen. Whoever saw his own soul, or the soul of another, whether the soul carries some shadow of likeness to God in its powers and faculties, being endowed with understanding, will and affections, which are to some respect similar to what is in God, or there is that in God which these are a faint resemblance of. And though it consists of mere faculties, there is but one soul, as God, though his perfections are many, and his persons three, yet there is but one God. 2. The image of God in the soul of man, of the first man particularly, appeared in the qualities of it, 
especially in his wisdom, knowledge and understanding, and in its righteousness and holiness. For if the spiritual image in regeneration consists in these things, though in a higher and more excellent manner, and of the superior nature, it may be reasonably thought the natural image of God in man consisted in these things in a natural way. Colossians 3.10, Ephesians 4.24 1. It lay in knowledge and understanding. Adam, in his state of innocence, had a large share of natural knowledge. He knew much of himself, both of the constitution of his body and the powers of his mind. He knew much of the creatures made and given for his use, and over which he had the dominion, and to whom he gave names suitable to their nature. He had a larger knowledge of God as his creator and benefactor in a natural way through the creatures. For if God and the perfections of his nature are in some measure to be known from the works by the light of nature, now man is fallen and so as to be left without excuse. A much greater degree of knowledge of him must man unfallen be supposed to have, and who doubtless had knowledge of the trinity of persons in the Godhead. Since they were so manifestly concerned in the creation of all things, and particularly in his own, and this seems necessary, that he might yield that worship and adoration which was due from him to each of them. But then he knew nothing of Christ, as Redeemer, as Mediator, Redeemer and Saviour. This was not revealed to him until after his fall, nor did he need it before, on which it was made known to him, that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head and be the saviour of him and his posterity nor did he know anything of pure spiritual and evangelical truths and which were not suitable to the state in which he was such as justification by the righteousness of christ pardon of sin through his blood atonement by his sacrifice and eternal life as the free gift of god through him these were things his eyes had not seen nor ear heard nor did enter into his heart to conceive of before his fall, and the revelation of them to him which was made upon that. But then he knew all things necessary to be known by him, all things natural, moral, and civil. Yet he had some things revealed to him which he knew under the prophetic spirit. Some things passed as the formation of Eve out of his rib, and no doubt his own formation and the manner of it and the whole creation and the order of the six days and other things to come as the eve should be the mother of all living and their marriage as it was appointed would be continued in the world for the propagation of the species two the image of god in adam further appeared in the rectitude righteousness and holiness in which he was made for god made him upright the holy and righteous creature ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 which holiness and righteousness were in their kind perfect. His understanding was free from all error and mistakes. His will biased to that which was good. His affections flowed in the right channel towards their proper objects, and there were no sinful motions and evil thoughts in his heart, nor any propensity and inclinations to that which was evil, and the whole of his conduct and behaviour was according to the will of God. And this righteousness of his was natural, and not personal, and not personal and acquired. It was not obtained by the exercise of his free will. It was lost, but not got that way. Had it been personal and acquired by his own power, and made up of acts of his own, when lost it would only have been lost for himself, and his posterity would have no concern in it. But it was a righteousness of his nature. It was co-created, or created with it, and so common to all and had he stood in it, would have been propagated to his posterity. But, on the contrary, he sinned, whereby his nature was defiled, a corrupt nature is propagated instead of it, and the papists, and those of the same complexion with them, say that Adam was created in his pure naturals. Their meaning is that he was created neither holy or unholy, neither righteous nor unrighteous, but capable of being either the one or the other, as he made use of the power of free will. This notion is advanced in favour of man's free will and to weaken the doctrine of original sin. 3. 
The image also lies in the freedom of the will and the power of it. As God is the free agent, so is man. And as the freedom of divine will does not lie in and in determination to good and evil, but is only to that which is good, so was the will of man in his state of integrity, as likewise the will of good, angels and glorified saints. A man had a power to obey the will of God and do his commands, and as he had not only a positive law given him to abstain from the forbidden fruit, as a trial of his obedience, so he had a moral law written on his heart, as the rule of his obedience, and had power and ability to keep it, and as it was required of him to love the Lord his God with all his heart and soul and strength, so he could, if he would, have performed the same, and such strength and ability was due unto him from the laws of creation. For if God required of him obedience to his holy law, it was but fitting right that he should give him a conformity of nature and will to do, and power to obey, though he was not obliged to give him grace and strength and perseverance, nor to render him impeccable and immutable, whereas leaving him to his mutability and will, he sinned and fell from his former estate, which on that account is called vanity. Psalm 39 verse 5. 3. The image of God in the whole man's soul and body, or in his person, lay in his immortality, natural to his soul, conferred on his body, and also in his dominion over the creatures. For this was the end of God's purpose in the creation of him, that he might have dominion over the beasts of the field, and fowls of the air, and fishes of the sea, and accordingly all were subject to him. Genesis 1, 26, 28, Psalm 8, verse 6 to 9, in which he resembled God, the governor of the universe, and hence kings, governors, civil magistrates are called gods, because they bear such a likeness to him. Psalm 82, verse 6. 4. And lastly, this image lay in the blessedness of man, in his original state. For as God is God over all and blessed, and is the blessed and only potentate, so man, in lower sense, was blessed above all the creatures, having an healthful constitution, an immortal body, and everything grateful and suitable to it, and the soul knowing, wise, holy, just and good, and he placed in the most delightful spot in the whole globe, with all the profusion of nature about him, and all creatures subject to him, enjoying communion with God, through the creature, though but in a natural way, and God was pleased sometimes to appear to him and talk with him, and yet man, being thus in honour, abode not long, but became like the beasts that perish, so that we may look back and see from what a high estate man is fallen, and to what a low estate sin has brought him, by means of which he has come short of the image and glory of God in which he was created, and yet may adore the grace and wisdom of God which has brought us into a more excellent state by Christ, a state more spiritual, firm and secure. Adam's knowledge was natural knowledge, his holiness and righteousness natural, holiness and righteousness, the covenant made with him, a natural covenant. The communion he had with God was a natural way, and all his benefits and blessings natural ones. But believers in Christ are blessed with all spiritual blessings in him, and have a spiritual image stamped upon them, which can never be lost, and into which they are changed from glory to glory till it becomes perfect.